I was born in the ancient capital city of Krakow, but we lived in a city in northern Poland called Toruń. Basically, it was a German-speaking city, even though it was Polish. And if you didn't speak German in Toruń, you, you didn't eat. So uh, that was my first language, clearly. My mom was a, uh, you know, a very cultured, refined lady, um, a very a beautiful lady. Um, she was uh, probably the quintessential Jewish mother, maintained a beautiful home, doted on my father and on the family. My father actually was a very, very high-ranking business executive. Even at a young age, he was in the export business. Actually exported ham and bacon to the United States, which is kind of amusing to most of my Jewish friends. He was in the United States with my mother in 1939. And their reports about you know, what was going on in Germany were not encouraging. And particularly after Kristallnacht, you know, which was a horrible incident in Germany where the Nazis for the first time, you know, started burning Jewish stores and breaking windows and stuff. So my parents made a decision not to go back. The problem with that decision was that I was staying with my grandmother in Warsaw. And um, so the, the challenge was, well, okay, fine. <laughs> we don't go back. Uh, what happens to Tad? So they made arrangements with Uncle Norbert to bring me to the United States. The trip from Warsaw to Paris, which was our first stop, uh, takes right through the heart of what was then Nazi Germany. At every stop, uh, there was an inspection of the train by Gestapo. And I remember it was almost like a Hollywood movie script, you know, with the, these Gestapo officers, you know, coming in. Your papers, please! You know, of course, I was terrified because I had a travel pass that had my religion stamped on it. That was customary in Poland. Theoretically, they could have seized us. At that point, I was uh, barely eight years old. First stop was Paris. We were trying to get some kind of uh, travel papers to allow us to get on a ship to go to the United States. And we boarded the Queen Mary in uh, Cherbourg, large French port. I was on the Queen Mary for a, about a five-day crossing to, to New York, and I will tell you, uh, we were in a tiny little cubicle of a room uh, below the water line. When we landed in New York Harbor, I didn't have an entry visa to the United States. So my uncle and I uh, were put on a ferry boat boarded off the Queen, right onto a ferry boat, and taken to that famous resort called Ellis Island. That's like a penitentiary. It was, it was really awful. Uh, I remember that experience uh, rather vividly, and it was not pleasant. Uh, but we finally did get papers. We landed in New York Harbor, and my mother was there in tears, you know, greeting her little boy that she hadn't seen for months at that point. My mother and father made a very good decision to send me to a boys camp in upstate New York almost immediately upon my arrival in, in New York City. It's an amazing thing, you know, you throw a kid of eight years of age into total immersion and a magic thing happens, you know, you learn the language. So I was at Crane Lake Camp for about eight weeks. When I left the camp, I was fluent. Not only fluent, I didn't even have an accent. They decided we we're gonna get into the family sedan and make a journey out of it. We went from Manhattan to Niagara Falls to Black Mountain of the Dakotas to Yellowstone Park, you know, all of the wonderful sites. We then uh, settled in in what is now the Korean part of Los Angeles, in a very skimpy one-bedroom apartment. Uh, I had the bedroom, and my mother and father were on a Murphy bed in the living room. I mean, things were really tough for the Toby family at that point. My mother worked as a waitress to get by. Uh, my father uh, got a job as a night watchman. 
And then good fortune struck the Toby family. I was uh, screened by Metro Goldwyn Mayer for a part in a movie. This was a film called uh, The Greenie, and it was about a little Polish kid that ends up in the east side of New York and sees a sandlot baseball game going on, looks out the window wistfully, wants to get involved, and the father says, no, it's too dangerous, and the housekeeper, who is also Polish, says, no, let him go out and meet some friends, so I go out, and they beat me up, and, you know, and eventually they allow me to enter the baseball game, and I hit a home run, and, you know. The rest is history. One of the things that happened was I was making $25 a day. And I gotta tell you, I was the highest earner in my family at that point. You know, I mean, my mother wasn't making $25 a day and my father wasn't making, but I was. I made three movies and I was on my way, I think, to sort of a half-assed career in Hollywood. And then my parents decided that this was not something they wanted their little son to be involved in because my education was in studio school. So it wasn't the kind of education that, uh, that my mother and father thought was appropriate for a young Jewish boy in uh, America. So my father, when I was about, a, I don't know, must have been in my junior year at University High School, West Los Angeles. You know, we had that traditional conversation that you often see in the movies. Son, have you thought about college? I said, yes, I have, Dad. I'm going to UCLA. And he says, you're going to Stanford. And I said, oh, yes, sir. And that was the end of that conversation. I actually didn't get into Stanford. I got a very lovely letter telling me that while you're very qualified, you know, we get so many applicants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, we offer you the opportunity to participate in a provisional program that we have at Stanford, which is the summer quarter program. And the way the summer quarter program worked is you were admitted to summer quarter. It was basically a trial. I survived and uh, went to UCLA uh, for a quarter, came back to Stanford in the uh, winter of 1950. I was in, enrolled in Air Force ROTC. I, I got a telegram from the, the President of the United States. Greetings, you are hereby ordered to proceed, you know, da 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 da. I was activated to active duty in the Air Force. The United States Air Force decided that I should be a communications officer. I headed up a, a, a unit that installed ground-to-air communications equipment, which some of which is still there. I went re-enrolled at Stanford in graduate school. I was in a hybrid program at Stanford that was a collaborative program between the School of Engineering and the Graduate School of Business. It's called Industrial Management. And then I got a job working for an old line company in San Francisco that manufactured electric heating equipment. At that time, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company was giving uh, a incentive to home builders thousands of dollars if they would build either an all electric or an all gas home. And I became rather intrigued with this process you know, that you could actually build something and get paid for doing it. So I retired from Wessex and went into the real estate business, building apartments. I was contacted by one of my real estate investment clients, a fellow by the name of Stan Hurstein, who was a vice president for a company called Coret of California. Stan said, we just finished a public offering and our founders, Joe and Steffi Corrette, ended up with about $7 million that they netted for themselves. And they were looking to diversify because their whole fortune was in this, you know, in this rag company, this apparel company. I, I had lunch with him. I said, how are the Correttes doing in their real estate endeavor? And he said, not very good. And I said, well, I know why they're not doing very good. He said, you know why? I said, yeah, I told him. And I said, well, would you tell that to Mr. and Mrs. Corrette, I said, sure. So they ushered me in to Joe Corrette's office and he's sitting in a high back chair. 
And he had all these senior executives, you know, the president of the company, the chief financial officer, the controller, you know, his secretary, his personal assistant, his wife, everybody was in that room. And he's leaning back in his chair. He says, well, Mr. Toby, Mr. Hertzstein tells me that you know all the reasons why we're not making any deals. I said, there's only one reason, Mr. Corrett. All these people in the room. You know, you can't make deals when you have a jury that's going to be involved in every decision. The real estate business is very entrepreneurial. By the time you folks are, you know, through evaluating whatever it is that Mr. So-and-so brings to you, that opportunity is gone. You need to find somebody that you trust and allow him or her to go out and be your representative in the market and make deals. So he says, so? Go out and make some deals. Well, that was how I got to be, you know, familiar with uh, the Corets, and uh, and that then led to a whole other career. Because what happened is I made them a ton of money. I mean, really, over a very short period of time. So I became sort of a central figure in their life. You know, I became the son they never had. Joe and Steffi share because they had everything in community property, it was probably something on the order at that point of about, worth about 30 million, 35 million dollars. They had about 35% of the company. Steffi, in the meanwhile, dies and leaves her share of the community property to Joe. I said, Joe, you don't want to take the money because we were in a very high inheritance tax bracket at that point. And I finally convinced him that he could become a world-class philanthropist if he let the money flow into a nonprofit and then use that nonprofit to further his own philanthropy. And meanwhile, I'm involved with a very good friend of mine by the name of Jim Joseph, who's also a real estate developer. So Jim says, look, uh, I've been approached uh, to help organize a new football league called the United States Football League, the USFL. I said, Jim, uh, what do I know about professional football? He says, look, you'll enjoy it. I'll sell you a minority interest. You get to know the people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a courageous venture, and uh, I believe in competition. And the idea of competing with the National Football League was attractive. The USFL had made plans to formally announce the startup of the league. It was going to be a big deal with the horseshoe table of all the owners and Howard Cosell. At precisely that time, Alex Spanos buys an interest in the San Diego Chargers and is disqualified by NFL rules and by our rules in owning an interest in the USFL. Twelve chairs around a horseshoe table and 11 owners. Bad situation on, on nationwide TV. So the owner said, Tad, you've got to sit in that 12th chair and be the designated owner my intention and the intention of the owners was to take me out. I was a shell. So I come home, I get off the plane, and all these flash bulbs are going off. And I'm looking behind me, wondering, does Paul Newman get off the plane behind me or what? It was me. I got off that plane, and I was a celebrity. I was a celebrity because I was the new owner of the Bay Area franchise of the United States Football League. Was I going to be taken out after being on the front pages of all the newspapers and the lead story on all the television and radio program? I was, didn't have the stomach to do that. So I decided to ride it out and became an owner of what became the Oakland Invaders of the USFL. It lasted three years. Uh, and then, as you probably know, we sued the NFL for antitrust and we won one dollar. <laughs> While I was CEO of the Corette Empire, I became uh, involved with the American Friends of the Hebrew University, which was sort of my first real philanthropic involvement. A few years later, I received their highest 
philanthropic award, which is the Scopus Award. Having the challenge of all of this money that we had to award intelligently, and I underscore the word intelligently, I got a very, very significant education through that experience, there's no, no doubt about it. He is measured in his analysis and uh, he is uh, honest uh, and principled in his decisions with respect to donations and he is also decisive. Well, my first trip back to Poland uh, was in the context of my being CEO of, of the Coret Empire. We had a division in Racine, Wisconsin called Rainfair. I happened to be aware of the fact that Poland by that time became a significant manufacturer of raincoats, top coats, outerwear in general. And so I made a journey. The landscape was very depressing. Everything was gray in Poland at that time. The sky was gray, the buildings were gray, the people were gray. Everybody, you know, there was no laughter, no joy. Now let me contrast that with now, today. Today the Rynek is wall-to-wall -wall outdoor restaurants. There are orchestras playing, usually several orchestras playing in the middle of the square. You know, people in a festive state, no matter what day of the week or what time of year. I got very interested in the whole concept of Jewish peoplehood. In most educational settings, uh, the study of matters that relate to, to Jews are generally focused on religion and focused on uh, Israel. I viewed uh, Jewish uh, life as a much broader perception. The one piece that was always kind of missing was Poland. Uh, Poland was missing because the Jews were missing. I mean, you know, uh, the Nazis virtually annihilated uh, most of the Jewish population of Europe. So having come to that conclusion, I decided that I would start to uh, include Poland in my philanthropy. You know, one of the things people talk about now when they talk about Poland is the, is the museum. I don't believe that the Pauline Museum would even exist without Tad's decision to finance it and to really fight to have a recognition and its existence. You can't create a history museum out of nothing. There has to be some kind of remnant of culture and history and so forth and, and I think we've contributed a lot of that. It is different and it is uh, intellectually much more challenging than a conventional museum. It is also much more attractive in terms of uh, activity, in terms of depiction of the history of the Jews in Poland. It uses modern methods of technology with respect to screening historical scenes. It's become a real destination attraction. My husband and I and a number of his and our friends went to Poland and we got to see the amazing impact he's had on Poland and of course on the Jewish community in Poland. He's really helped bring about a reawakening of the importance of the Jewish community to the nation of Poland. Well, he's just a wonderful person, and he is a—he has a terrific sense of humor. Uh, he is a, you know, very care, caring about the community, and um, and he loves Stanford, and he can't do enough for Stanford. So he takes care of his friends as he would his family. He's just a wonderful human being. I uh, am uh, greatly impressed 
by uh, how vigorous uh, he is and how he uh, tends to give expression to uh, that fertile mind of his. And I just hope that uh, he continues to do so and that I am a recipient of uh, his wisdom and his judgment and his integrity and his honesty. Tad has done it all, seen it all, and done the impossible. And that is a great friend.